Let's complement the atmospheric circulation with the wind-driven and thermohaline circulations of the ocean. Immediately you see the differences in the surface current map. What is the difference? Winds obviously can go across the globe. They can climb the mountains, cross the oceans, come from the... Uh, and make a full circle. But the oceans have boundaries. So as the winds try to drag the ocean, they hit the boundaries and then there are some specific features to the ocean which are closely related or which are driven uh, by the uh, dependence of the Coriolis effect with latitude. We talked about Coriolis effect, but the additional detail that's very critical for uh, atmospheric and oceanic circulation is that Coriolis effect is zero on the equator. It's just a linear motion. As you step off and go towards the poles, the uh, effect begins to increase. So the tilting that is proportional to the speed with which you are moving is going to increase. Okay, That gives us strong uh, warm boundary currents on this side, like on the western side. It's called western boundary intensification. I have podcasts you can look up. Uh, Kuroshio here, uh, Gulf Stream here. Indian Ocean is uh, a mess because of the reversing monsoonal circulations. In the winter you have winds from the northeast and in the summer you have winds from the southwest. So it doesn't have <coughs> the persistent uh, western boundary current but it does have a very strong Somali current that is a western boundary current but completely reverses signs. Uh, on the polar side also you have strong western boundary currents and on the eastern side you get broad colder uh, coastal currents like California current, Canary current, also in the southern hemisphere of course, Benguela current, Brazil current, uh, Peru current and East Australia current. So the closing of the currents is kind of complicated as well because of the boundaries but you see the subtropical gyre with the high pressure in the middle and if you use your Coriolis now this is moving this way push to the uh, right so it will come to the middle. This is moving this way, push to the right so it will come to the middle. So in the middle you will pile up water and push it down. So you get downwelling, so no production. So they become like the uh, deserts of the ocean. We will see again the ocean color animation where we will clearly see that the chlorophyll in the ocean is uh, very low in these regions because there is no nutrient supply to the surface where there is light. Okay, so here comes my chopper again and you can see the differences in the southern and northern hemispheres as well uh, because of those asymmetries. Uh, let me pause it. Asymmetries in uh, the uh, atmosphere manifest themselves on the ocean as well, clearly. And there are lots of details. You can see that the Kuroshio goes right across here and doesn't do much here, whereas the uh, North Atlantic is dominated by the warm waters brought in by the Gulf Stream, which becomes the North Atlantic current and goes all the way into Norwegian seas, curves around and uh, comes into Greenland and Labrador. So the Greenland uh, glacier melt that we talked about is related to these special features associated with the uh, Greenland current uh, or the North Atlantic current uh, coming all the way up here. And we also mentioned how the Southern Ocean is very different because it's a channel. So winds, unlike here, can continue to churn the ocean and the wind impact can go all the way to the bottom. So you get uh, currents uh, known as the Atlantic Circumpolar Current or the West Wind Drift and then uh, close to the continent you get another uh, circulation as well. So there is exchanges between the Southern Ocean and these oceans but this also has a special impact on the atmosphere. So the warm water that comes in here warms the atmosphere Every time we say warm atmosphere, we have to understand it's going to hold more moisture. So the evaporation from the ocean is going to load the moisture in the atmosphere and give much milder weather here compared to here at the same latitude. But more importantly, that evaporation creates uh, heavy waters because evaporation leaves salt behind. So there is a North Atlantic deep water forming here which sinks to some depths below the surface and 
sets up the deep ocean circulation. So this is the wind driven circulation which is basically confined to about top 100 uh, meters to about a kilometer or so going a little bit deeper in these uh, gyres and down here but the deep ocean which moves very very slowly so slowly in fact that you can't even measure it directly uh, is driven by these sinking waters which happen in two places here and Ross Sea and the Delphi and here in the North Atlantic. So that circulation is called thermohaline circulation because it is driven by temperature and salt, thermohaline. So you can see here deep water formation uh, it's called North Atlantic deep water. There is also deep water formation here that flows down into the Southern Ocean, uh, makes some rounds over time, inundates the Indian Ocean, which is different because it's closed off here, and also into the North Pacific, which all that water over hundreds to thousands of years gets converted back into the surface water and flows back. You can see the warm water path here. The blue lines are the cold water or deep intermediate water pathways the surface, near surface waters are coming back into the Atlantic and into the uh, deep water formation sites in the Southern Ocean. How do we know that these waters are actually getting converted back to surface water? Obviously we can go here and observe that water is sinking. You can go in winter months and see these plumes of heavy water sinking like a rock. If they are sinking that means they are they continue to be heavier than the waters above so the deep water is not getting filled up like a bathtub which means it's getting slowly converted because of tidal forcing and so on we don't completely understand the process of mixing and uh, conversion of the heavy bottom waters to uh, light surface waters but uh, you can see that this simple argument will tell you that they are getting converted back uh, so this is a more complicated combination of the uh, wind driven and uh, thermohaline circulations but the southern ocean is like a mixing bowl uh, all of the ocean water sees the surface uh, here at some point and then inundates the bottom uh, deeper oceans in the Pacific and uh, Indian Ocean so you can see the complex pathways of circulation here uh, Atlantic deep water coming into the Southern Ocean, uh, the Antarctic uh, bottom and intermediate waters going into the Pacific and Indian Oceans, converting to surface waters uh, coming back. Uh, so that this pathway here, the Indonesian through flow it is called, it's a cri critical low latitude pathway of this thermohaline circulation. Okay, so this is where ocean can take away lots of heat and greenhouse gases because waters are constantly exchanging heat and greenhouse gases and other uh, elements with the atmosphere and if they sink they're going to take everything down with them including oxygen, carbon dioxide and uh, so on. Okay, so we will talk about the abrupt climate change now. We looked at paleoclimate observations. We will now come back to uh, paleoclimate uh, and talk about abrupt uh, climate change because that is related to this thermohaline circulation and the heat transport associated with it. So we talked about Hadley cell and so on. Ocean has this thermohaline circulation uh, and other upper ocean wind driven circulations which are doing heat transport. Uh, it turns out that ocean does most of the heat transport in low latitudes and atmosphere does almost all of the uh, transports at higher latitudes across those across those uh, mid-latitude storm tracks we talked about. 